Hello, welcome. Um, after a few technical difficulties, we are here, so well done. Um, tonight, I want to talk about um, the power of meditation to change your mind. And I'm not going to give a whole lot of scientific evidence and all of that sort of thing. I'm going to base this talk mostly on my own experience because um, I think that quite often is the experience that really helps people, uh, especially if they're struggling to establish meditation as a practice in their own life or just so that they can um, know where it's heading. Uh, and I have gleaned along the way a bit of understanding of, about what's going on in your mind. So basically what we are doing in meditation uh, by bringing our mind into focus or a concentration on either um, it can be um, a mantra, it can be a breath, some people use, uh, can you hear me, it's saying my speaker's not working. Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, okay. So <clears throat> basically when you focus, when you bring the mind into a point of focus, uh, and this is especially what we call the first stage of meditation, what you are doing is you are training your mind. And so when you train your mind in this way, um, over often many years, um, the mind, it enables the part of your it enables the part of you that observes to see the mind at play. So what's happening is usually if we if we never meditate, we have thoughts running in our mind all the time, um, and these thoughts. A lot of these thoughts are not our own. A lot of these thoughts we've picked up along the way. A lot of these thoughts come from our parents, from our teachers, from influential people. Um, a lot of them are just the mundane thoughts that help us to run our lives. And quite often people feel like they are at the mercy of those thoughts rule their mind. And they don't realize that there is a choice in that. They just think, people think, oh, well, these are the thoughts in my mind. Um, this is just how the mind is. Until a person starts to meditate. And what we do in meditation, we take that, we take our mind and we focus in on something. And that capacity to focus enables us to detach, if you like, or step back from those thoughts in our mind every day and simply observe them. And by sitting into the place of the silent witness to being able to observe those thoughts, uh, quite a few profound changes happen in our mind. And the first thing that happens is we can start to just see thoughts come into our mind, pass through and pass out of our mind. And sometimes they'll capture our awareness, our attention, and we'll go off on a train of thought. But as we practice our meditation, we'll get good at seeing that we have done that. We go off on a train of thought and we realize we've done that. And then we pull ourselves back to the breath, back to the mother, back to the candlestick, or whatever we're meditating on. And that act of coming back is the disciplining of the mind. Because if you can observe those everyday thoughts, who is observing them? And that's that's the thing that not, doesn't become an intellectual understanding. With the practice of meditation, that becomes an experiential knowing. You come to know that you are not your thoughts because you can step back from them and simply wish them. So that's the first thing that happens when people first start meditating. Often when they first start meditating, people become so aware of the thoughts in their mind that it's overwhelming. They feel like there's more thoughts than they even realize were running through their mind. And sometimes people get put off 
at that first stage because it brings up all that's running in their mind and they realize that how much of that the thoughts in their mind are not particularly valuable or don't serve them. They might feel quite critical of those thoughts. So as the person practices meditation and they develop this capacity to step back from the thoughts and simply observe them and to come back to that place of the observer, whenever the mind or the ego, the personality, the thoughts pull them back in, because what you'll also notice when you start to meditate, it might all come up with the most enticing thoughts that pull you back in to just thinking those thoughts. Uh, and you'll start to recognize that. You'll start to see, yeah, uh, there's certain thoughts that really grab you. Um, and the mind will bring these up attempting to bring you back into just thinking thoughts and not being in any other way aware of what's going on in your mind. So if you can stick with that discipline, eventually you can step back from the thoughts, you can observe them, and what starts to happen is that you can start to choose uh, if you give them attention or not in your everyday life. And this is what we don't always realize is you may spend minutes in the morning or you might do meditation morning and evening um, and they think well that's it for meditation that's the only time that I get I get a sense of peace I can step back from my thought I get a connection with um, a real strength a core essence of me uh, and then I go about my normal life, my mind carries on just with thoughts zooming all the time. And I go with, you know, I do what I need to do in my everyday life. But what actually happens is that process of just practicing regularly, stepping back from the thoughts, starts to infiltrate into your everyday life. And how it does this is it starts to give you the capacity to step back from thoughts when you're just out in the world. And that capacity means that you have a pause. You have that pause before you respond to something or before you believe something in your mind or before you give it attention. So you might have a thought that comes through your mind um, that's been going through your mind for years and you suddenly go, actually, no, no, uh, you don't serve me. You're not true. That sounds like somebody else from my past. That's a thought that that's a belief I no longer value. And so you choose not to go with that train of thought. And it, it can be, instant. it can be just like that. You just, Nah, not going there. Um, and I'll give you an example from my own life. And this is how I think I came to meditation. It was um, a bit depressing. When I was about 16, I developed anorexia. And for the next, I don't know, five years, probably more, um, what was happening is I had almost like the anorexic voice in my head. So this anorexic voice would tell me that I was too fat, even though I was very thin. <laughs> um, and, or it would tell me, it would be speaking to me. And I would start, as I started to work through this illness, I started to recognize the anorexic voice and another sort of voice and reason in my mind. And so that, having that voice, I learned just so no, no, we're not going there, no, or to recognize when that, that animated voice was coming up and just to choose not to give it attention. Now, this took years, this was before I started to learn to meditate. And what I think it did was it gave me, it was almost a, an exercise in, in mind control, in meditation in a way, because I would recognize that that wasn't true. 
uh, and I would also start to recognize that there were certain times when I was vulnerable to being coaxed by that voice. So if you, as a teenager, if you're in a situation where you have to go out with mates and you're worried about what you're going to wear, or you're in a, a self-esteem type of a situation, or you're very tired or certain hormonal times, that sort of thing, you'd be more vulnerable to being pulled into that voice. Now, after a while, it took a few years, that voice, that anorexic voice, lost its power and went away and doesn't resurface. I don't have, and I've coached young girls through this illness, teaching this, that if you start to recognize, I got to the point where I would laugh at it. No, no, go away. Um, and that's who was laughing at those thoughts. So that anorexia voice was almost like the thoughts that run in your mind. That's an extreme example, but it enabled me to see it. It wasn't long after that, that, that in my early 20s, I started meditating and got involved in a couple of schools that taught meditation. But I think what had happened is I already had that capacity to just question what was going on in my mind. And this is what we don't do. People think that because thoughts are in their mind, that is who they are, that they are those thoughts. And it's not till they get any kind of experience of stepping back from those thoughts that they realize they are not those thoughts. And that is the key. And that experience can come in all sorts of ways. But once someone has experienced stepping back from those everyday thoughts, they can never not know that they are not their thoughts. You just can't not know that once you've had that experience. Whether you do anything with it is totally up to you. And I think people often are pulled toward meditation and it pulls them and they pull back and it pulls them and they pull back and they eventually come to meditation often takes a little while for, for them to come to it as a regular practice. So it's that capacity to realize you're not your thoughts. You are that which chooses to think them. And once you realize that and you practice that every day, so if you like in meditation, you are going to a place where you are simply practicing, you're training your mind step back from those everyday thoughts to connect with something that is your essence, your soul, your higher self, to connect with the part of you that comes to those thoughts. And that means those thoughts lose their power over you. So instead of them controlling you, you control them. You start to control how you think. And I'll give you another example of how this can start to work in, and how the power of the mind, of this change in your mind, can start to work, especially with the emotions and what, what goes on with us, with our emotions now, with the link between our thoughts and our emotions. So quite often what happens is people will have a thought. A thought will come into your mind and it has power if you enable it to stay in your mind. So many thoughts can pass through and they are of no harm whatsoever. It's once we hold on to power. Now remember, energy follows thoughts, so these thoughts have power. So perhaps a thought runs through your mind. Say the thought was, um, oh, I'm rubbish at talking in front of people in front of the camera. Okay, say so you don't like doing this. Say so you're like, oh, I don't want to get up in front of people. Um, that's your thought. And what that does is that thought held in my mind, because I'm like, oh, yeah, it creates um, a whole lot of neurotransmitters. It creates a whole lot of peptides and chemicals that create a feeling in your body that is, in con that is congruent with the thought. So whatever you're thinking, if you hold on to that thought and start to um, hold it in mind, it will create, through your biochemistry, it will create those feelings in your body. 
but for the ones that I was worried about getting up and talking in front of a whole lot of people, say, I'll start to feel butterflies in my stomach, I'll start to feel some muscles tensing, I'll start to feel a bit sweaty and my heart rate uh, increasing. And my feelings, I'll start to feel a bit less comfortable. Okay, I'm starting to get a bit worked up. And then what happens is the body, as the body starts to feel this way, there are chemical messengers relayed back to your mind that say the body's feeling like this. And what happens is the mind produces more thoughts in alignment with that. So you start remembering all the other times you got up for people and it didn't go well, or you start remembering when you felt sick you had to get up in front of people. Or you start remembering when it, do you know what I mean? What happens is you start going around this loop. So the thoughts and the emotions, how you're feeling in your body, how you're feeling, start going around in this loop. And before you know it, um, your body is in a high state of stress. And your whole body mind um, is in a state of stress, a high alert, out of your comfort zone. And your feelings and your thoughts have become, um, if this happens often enough, this almost becomes a personality trait. So if that circuit of thoughts became your response whenever you must speak in front of people it becomes a defining part of who you are now all of this we probably recognize any particular fear or challenge we have we'll go around this loop it might even be we've been around a loop so many times that it all happens so quickly we're not even aware of it we just this is who i am i'm not opposed to something getting up in front of people. I go to pieces, I freeze, I can't do what to say. Now, there's two things going on here. The first thing is, what if that first thought wasn't true? Because we tend to think that if our thoughts and our feelings are the same, it must be true. But because we un understand this loop that's going on between our feelings and our thoughts, um, and it's very quick, it's very quick. Uh, we tend to, uh, am I breaking am I, is the sound going? Yeah, I don't know, what, I'm really sorry, I'm not sure what's going on. It keeps telling me that my speaker's not working. My microphone is working. Um, I know that, but hopefully the recording is okay. Um, Let's just trust, okay. So what happens after, um, what if that first thought wasn't true? Or what if um, that first thought, we, we just thought, no, this time it's gonna be different. And that capacity to change our mind and to change a thought and to question that thought and to step back and say, no, well, this time might be different. I've, I've done some training on talking in front of people. I know my subject. I know the audience. This time might be different. And we don't go into that spin and that loop. And our body starts feeling confident. And then it, remem we, it sends chemicals to our brain. We start remembering other times when we overcame challenges and it turned out well. And we go into a different loop. So do you see how the capacity to step back from the thoughts in your mind and question them and decide whether they are true and decide whether they are self-affirming and whether they support you is an amazing capacity because it gives you the power not only to be in charge of the state of your mind, but to be in charge of the state of your body and your feelings. And this is how you can use the mind to not be pulled into the sea of emotions. So quite often we feel ruled. We can be pulled into our emotional state and feel quite reactive. And yet we have this power in our mind to see that starting to happen. Oh, no, I'm not going here with that one. Like me with the anorexia, I'm not going here with that one. I know where this goes. No. And we have a moment 
often only a moment or two before we get into that kind of thought feeling loop to to say no i'm not going there in my mind and people don't realize that this is what meditation gives you the power to do. So it gives you the power to change your mind, the power to choose what thoughts you give attention to and what you don't, just by getting you to question some of the thoughts in your mind. Um, the other thing that it does quite naturally uh, as you meditate, and this can take a little while, is there are fewer thoughts that run in your mind. I don't know whether it's uh, how that change, I don't fully understand how that change happens, but over years, you just start to realize that there aren't, you don't have the same chattering that the Buddhists call the monkey mind. There are just far fewer thoughts in your mind till it gets to the point where you only have the thoughts in your mind that you need for what you're doing you can choose that and i find this i mean sometimes my mind will be taken off on on a train of thought but largely my mind is clear largely it only has the thoughts i need for what i'm doing and this gives you an amazing capacity to work to focus and use your mind as a tool as it was designed to be used. So for example, if you're doing something, if you're working, you can be incredibly focused and incredibly efficient because you're not dealing with all those extra thoughts. You're just thinking the thoughts you need to do what you're doing. You become very mindful, very in the present moment, just thinking what's required. And the other thing it gives you the capacity to do is because you're winding up with your mind as like a trained instrument, you can start to really think. And this is what they call pure reasoning or what I call proper thinking. So you're not got all the stuff going on in your mind. You can take your mind like a chisel and you can take a topic and you can really think. And there's nothing distracting that process. It becomes a very powerful process. You can be having a conversation with, with someone, where, which would be what I'd call a deeper, meaningful, philosophical, usually a conversation where you are thinking of new information. So these are thoughts that have never been introduced to your mind before. Perhaps someone is bringing you some challenging ideas. Perhaps there's a new concept to understand. And what happens is you can just bring your whole mind to it. And what happens is, is the you realize the amazing capacity our mind has to think. And then if you take that even further and you go into meditation with an intention to just open your mind, so you go deep into meditation and you go into what I call the second stage of meditation. So the first stage of meditation is where we develop the capacity to focus and concentrate. So we'll be focusing, coming back to the breath. We'll be coming back to the mantra. We'll be coming back to something that's teaching, it's disciplining our mind, bringing us back. Every time our thoughts go off, we bring them back. And it's the coming back that matters, not the fact that we were distracted, but the fact that we realized and came back. And as we develop this capacity, we naturally start to move into what's called a second stage or, or a contemplative stage of meditation, where you no longer need to do that. The mind just learns to calm right down and you go into a deep place of um, peace um, it's very quiet you go inward but it expands outward and you can just be in a place where your mind is completely free and completely open to whatever is coming in so completely receptive and when you're in this place you can this is when you could ask a question of your intuitive self of your higher self and just be completely open to whatever comes in so without thoughts getting in the way you're in a very deep place a deep place of meditation when you reach this stage 
Um, and some people can, can easily go into this deep stage of meditation. Other people will go into it. They'll start with the sort of concentration focus stage and then drop into it. And what I've found over the years is um, when I meditate now, I don't need to do the concentration uh, focus stage at all. I can go straight into that deep um, on the whole, most of the time, go straight into that deep place. And the intuitive things, the understandings that come through make you realize that our, we don't know the half of what our mind is capable of. So I hope that that's helped to give you, it's, it's a different way of um, realizing how meditation can work because what starts to happen is, is all of that capacity that you're developing when you're meditating in your regular practice comes into your everyday life and just you start to have peace of mind as a normal state of being not all of the time life will throw you or bring up things but you know how to come back because you have a mind that is very disciplined a mind that is used to that focus and discipline of coming back um, and it, it becomes a process that's easy it's not you're not like in your mind having to um, watch every thought it's not like that at all it just happens um, so I hope that that has given you some insights. Um, we're going to go into the group meditation, uh, in a moment. Is the sound, has the sound settled down now? Yeah, good. Okay. Because what we're going to do over the next few weeks is explore this idea of developing our intuition. And we're going to look at some of the keys to being able to access our intuitive understanding and our intuitive wisdom. So we're going to have some fun. There's some really good, uh, what we call keys that open, uh, give you good practice at opening your mind, the intuitive part of your mind. So I'm going to leave that there and, and you'll probably have questions for me at the end, which I'll have a go at answering. So let's go into the group meditation. Now, I'm going to have to um, I'm going to have to just pause it for a moment so that I can bring up the um, affirmation of love. Okay, get yourself comfortable. Reasonably upright. Feet on the floor if you can, hands comfortably relaxed in your lap. Now just let everything that I've been talking about go, okay? Just let it go to the back of your mind um, and we'll come into this moment. And what I want to do is I want to bring us together as a group by repeating the affirmation of love. So if you repeat this to yourself, um, but we'll repeat it with the intention of coming together as a group. So in the center of all love, I stand. From that center, I, the soul, will outward move. From that center, I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the divine self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world. Now gently close your eyes and I want to begin the meditation by just grounding our energy. So I want you to imagine that you are sending roots down either through your feet or through the base of your spine down into the earth to make that connection. And now I'll bring us into this present moment. So just notice your body sitting on the chair. Notice the clothes on your skin. And turn your awareness to the sounds in this moment.
Now take that same awareness and I want you to bring it to your breath. So have a gentle focus on the breath and just notice it coming into your body and notice the breath as it leaves. And at first you will notice the breath in quite a physical way. But as you continue to focus on the breath, you'll find that your awareness goes inward and you're watching the breath from an inner perspective. So just keep a gentle focus on the breath. If your mind becomes distracted, as soon as you realize, just pull it back to the breath. And we do this without thoughts of criticism or judgment. We simply come back to the breath. Now allow your body to relax and the breath to become a little deeper. And just keeping your awareness on the breath, let it take you into a quiet place inside. And now I want you to bring your awareness to the center of your chest, into your heart center. And I want you to imagine that your heart is filling with light and love. And there's a feeling of opening or expanding in the center of your chest and your heart. And I want you to imagine that through your heart, you can connect with the very highest aspects of you. Just keep a gentle focus on breathing into the heart. Until you find that the thoughts in your mind have started to calm down.
and there is space between them. Now keeping this focus, breathing into the heart so that you are able to step back from those thoughts and just let them pass through your mind. They come in, they pass through, they pass out. And you keep a focus on the breath in the center of the heart. Now I want you to imagine that coming down through the crown of your head is brilliant white or violet purple or gold light. And it is flowing down through the major chakras or energy centers of your body. These are seven in number associated with your spine. And this light is opening centers and coordinating centers and allowing a beautiful flow of energy throughout your whole self. Now imagine your heart as a vessel. And it is through your heart that you distribute this light throughout your body. So your whole physical body is filling with this purifying, cleansing, healing light. There's a feeling of opening, of surrender. This strengthens your physical body, your immune system. Calming the emotions, bringing peace to your mind. Now continue to let this light fill your whole physical body until it starts to pour out into the energy field or the etheric body that surrounds your physical body. So it's coming down through the crown into the heart, starting to radiate out into your aura or your etheric body. Now imagine that this light is flowing out to encompass your whole home filling all the living beings in your home with light. And this light is love. Now let it flow out into the other homes on your street and your neighborhood. Filling all with light and love. Let it flow out into your community. Radiating out into the town or the city in which you live.
Now let it flow out to connect with all of the members in this group meditation, whether joining us live or through the recording. So that we combine our lights. And there's a tremendous outpouring of light and love that fills this whole nation. Now allow it to fill this whole part of the world. To flow out and fill this hemisphere. And then out to encompass the whole of the world. Pouring into the hearts and minds of all living beings. Now imagine you can see the whole of our planet surrounded by this light, like an aura. And see it healing and restoring the balance in nature. So the air is clean and fresh. Our water is pure and clear. We have a healthy ozone layer and our planet is healed. See the animal and plant life flourishing. And developing beautiful right relations between the kingdoms of the plants, the minerals, the animals and mankind. And the planet as a whole ecosystem. Now see this light flowing into the hearts and minds of all of mankind. Igniting a desire for peace, goodwill and right relations. Both within each every, and every individual. Between individuals and families and communities, between nations between all of mankind. Lifting our collective awareness, our collective consciousness. So that we can envision A life where we enjoy world peace. We find a way to live in harmony with all. There is compassion for our fellow man and right relations between us all. Hold a space for this energy to pour in through your physical body out radiate out joining with the others in this group and joining with all groups who work in group meditation in this way so that we join as light workers a new group of world servers who hold a space for this light and love for all Continue to hold your heart open. To use your mind to direct this energy of light and love.
Now we're going to continue this powerful distribution of light and love through repeating the great invocation. So say it to yourself for either aloud or silently, but say it with conviction. With a pause between each stanza to envisage and imagine the words playing out and having a powerful effect. So join me in repeating the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Ooh. Namaste. Lovely. Okay, now it's time for any questions. So I'm going to give you the um, ability to unmute yourself if you want to. Um, just let me know if you want to talk. Wave at me. Okay, Philip, go for it. Unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering um, what we've done a group meditation. What's your thoughts on how meditation is uh, extended into groups, particularly maybe, uh, you know, we actually maybe it's been difficult during the lockdown, physically present and together. Okay, so in meditation, it doesn't matter that we're not physically together um, because energy is when you have the intention to connect you do and it's the same with people doing the recording it, in the realm of meditation there is no time and space so a person could join our recording a week later and they're still in our group having the same effect i think um i don't know if you experience it in the group meditation but there is um a very special energy when you surrender to a group meditation because you are coming to that without looking for your own personal needs. You are coming to it from a place of wanting to help the greater good, um, a place of service. And if you can just surrender to it, often the energy that pours through you, I don't know if you notice, you, you know, after it you can feel, whoa, there's been a lot of energy pouring through. Um, that energy is because you are opening up to that process. Um, and it is powerful, you know, groups meditating is the way that, that um, you can work to make positive change in the world. And I think in earlier talks, I've, I've talked about, you know, 15% of the world working on higher levels can lift 
the consciousness and vibration of the other 85% of the world. And what happens when groups meditate is even if people are not consciously open to the positive energies that we are bringing through, if you like, as a group, even if they're not consciously open, it affects them unconsciously. And so, and that way it's pervading through, you know, when we imagine it filling our neighborhood and our community, we might be thinking there's a lot of people that won't be very open to this. It will be coming through into their energy field, into their unconscious mind, and just working away at, at the change. Um, and because we work, because we build meditation, because we're working on, on higher planes, if you like, of the mind, we are able, um, I think it was Blavatsky, I can't remember the exact quote, she said that um, thoughts, thoughts that are quite negative, um, fear and doubt and hate and anger have a very dense energy, a very dense vibration, and they require a lot of energy to generate and maintain. And anyone who's ever been really for any time knows it's really exhausting. They require a lot of energy. So as a collective whole, a lot of the fears and doubts, say, we've had over the last few months, that takes a lot of energy. Now, if you want to lift the vibration, when you start working up in meditation on higher planes, on higher Energies, you can shift energy much more easily. It's lighter. And so if you like people working up on a higher plane to and um, dissolve all those negative thought energies, those darker, more dense things thought energies. So when we come together as a group, the effects are logarithmic. So it's not even just an exponential curve. It's a curve off the graph in terms of each one of us coming in far more than multiplies the effects. And this is, this is the power of working in groups. So when, when we lift up into love and light and imagining the planet healing and imagining people developing right relations and coming to live in a place of peace, we are actually counteracting a lot of the mass media fear and doubt, a lot of the darker, deeper uh, vibrational energies. We are counteracting those. It's almost like if that energy was surrounding the planet, that darker fear energy and penetrating down into people, um, we're helping to dissolve that. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Lovely. Yes, thank you very much. Ian. Yeah, so it is, it is, and you get the energy first, don't get me wrong. <laughs> when you do a group meditation, that lovely energy that's pouring through is coming through your physical, your etheric, your mind, your body, and radiating out. That's, that's, you know, why we, I create a channel that's vertical. Last week. So when we come into meditation, we align vertically with our higher self. And then from the heart, that's why I radiate out from the heart, we go out on the horizontal in an act of service. And so we align ourselves vertically, and then th that's the cross. And we are, that's why it is an act of service or sacrifice to do group meditation. I mean, you could be watching soap operas on the TV tonight or at the pub or doing something else, but no, you choose to come and do a group meditation. And that's a different mindset. Um, that, is, that is you wanting to make a difference as well as, you know, experience being in a group and working in this way because it is such a positive experience. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I'm trying to see you all at once. Ah, there you go. You always look a bit stunned after um, the group meditation. It can be quite powerful energies come through. Um, and it can be a bit, ooh. 
So does anyone have any questions on their own personal practice of, of meditation or on um, what I was talking about in terms of what it does to your mind or how it changes your mind? I mean, you can go online and read. There's lots of really positive benefits physically um, to meditating. You know, there's even, there's lots of studies now documenting that people who meditate don't show, for example, the same age-related negative changes in their brains and nervous systems. As people less loss of gray matter. Memory tends to be sharper and not deteriorate. There's all sorts of really positive benefits in that way. I wanted to more look at what was going on from um, a more, my experience in your mind. That's something that's often spoken of. Um, and that comes purely with practice and time. <laughs> uh, but hopefully it will give you just that impetus. If you're feeling like, usually in meditation, if you're feeling like you're getting nowhere, that's actually the time you are, you know, especially if you, you start feeling like your mind, it's like in the Bhagavad Gita when Krishna is trying to teach Arjuna to take the reins, to take control of his mind. His higher self is, is taking the reins and just all those everyday thoughts that are running. And often it's a battleground. It is, you know, it, it takes this mind. If your mind hasn't been disciplined, it takes a bit. It's like an athlete training. When you first go for that first run, it hurts. <laughs> when you go for the next run, it's not quite so bad and you gradually get fit. Well, meditation is like a training for your mind. But the benefits, uh, in my experience, I mean, I don't even understand all of what goes on, but it just naturally starts to filter out into your life and gives you capacities um, that are really valuable for living in everyday life that really help, let alone developing you spiritually. Uh, so it is a powerful, it's probably the most powerful practice uh, that you can do for your mind um, and for taking, especially if you would like, you'd like to sit in your own mind and feel at home there, feel comfortable there, feel like you're home, you're in charge. Um, you are determining what comes into your mind. And, you know, naturally you'll start um, I think what starts to happen is you develop discrimination, you develop discernment, you start to be able to listen to your intuitive sense of what's true and what isn't and run it by an internal truth ometer that we have built in. And you start to uh, develop a confidence in your own mind. Um, and, it, and its capacities. Uh, even if you are thrown by life, you know how to come back. You know how to realign yourself and reconnect with that part of you that is always strong, calm, and clear, and doesn't get caught up in and reactive to life. It steps back and just lets life play out. Um, that's my witness, if you like. Um, so if nobody's got any further questions, um, I will leave it there. And we, next week, these keys to, um, I'm just going to give a bit of an overall understanding of the tarot, because the tarot is a key to diving into your intuitive wisdom. Uh, if it's used in that way. Uh, many people are a bit, uh, not sure about the tarot, so I thought I'd just, I'm not going to go into a depth, but we'll talk about that as a key to developing your intuition. And then I think the week after, um, Ted's going to join us again and talk a bit more about the spiritual diary as a key and especially how it develops the Antekarana or the Rainbow Bridge. So we've got, we've got some good things coming up. So go and have a lovely evening.
and thank you very much for joining me. Sorry about the Mercury retrograde interfering with our recording <laughs> and things. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Yeah. Good night. Thank you.